Ice Stories Live. And my church leader said, look, we're too busy. I'm too busy. I don't mind you having a meeting, but you arrange it. And so I contacted Christian Vision for Men. I spoke to a guy called Nathan Blackaby. Nathan is the chief exec officer for CBM. And I asked him if he would come to the Northeast and have a meeting. And so what I did was I took a step of faith. I arranged the meeting. I put some notices out there. It was a cold, miserable autumn night back in 2014. And 88 guys turned out that night to hear the good news of Jesus. 88 fellas turned out on a cold and miserable night in the Northeast to hear the good news of Jesus. And at the end of that meeting, Nathan took me to one side and he says, God's got a job for you, brother. I would like you to become an area coordinator for Christian Vision for Men. I would like you to take on this ministry in the Northeast. And so I stepped up to the plate and I accepted Nathan's invitation. And so from 2014 to 2016, I was calling meetings in Gated and around the region. I was arranging social outings, speakers. I was sourcing speakers, giving testimonies, contacting local churches in the Northeast. And the ministry began to grow. Two years later, 2016, I was summoned to the office of CBM. And they said they were really impressed with the work I was doing. And they asked me to come on board as a regional director. That was in 2016. And so I've had the honor and the privilege of serving Christian Vision for Men across the Northeast, contacting churches, sharing the good news of Jesus, winning men for the kingdom of God. Do you know, I've had the pleasure of standing with men who've been in a similar position to me, who were on the brink of suicide. But I've brought them into the light. I've shown them the love of Jesus. Thank God. And so there is a fact, as long as I have breath, as long as I have life, I will continue to serve Jesus. And I want to take you back to that scripture that I opened with. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 14, it says, When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. God doesn't just want our prayers. He desires to have a living relationship with us and to be included in every area of our lives. Do you know God breathed his very life into you, and he made us in his own image. And as I said to you before, I wanted to share the importance of faith, because my faith has been very important with my battle with cancer. In Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In Matthew 9, verse 20 to 22, it says, we look at the woman who had the issue of blood. She suffered for 12 whole, year, whole years. No doctor could heal her. She reached out and touched the edge of Jesus' cloak. And Jesus told her, take heart. Your faith has healed you. In Matthew 9, verse 27 to 31, it says, two blind men called out, have mercy on a son of David. Jesus asked them, do you believe I'm able to do this? He touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, it shall be done to you. And their sight was restored. In Matthew 17, verse 14 to 16, we read of the boy with epilepsy. The disciples were unable to, unable to heal the boy. Jesus rebuked his disciples and said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I put up with you? Jesus healed the boy. His disciples asked why they couldn't heal him. And Jesus replied, because of your lack of faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. All things are possible to him who believes. And so today, reach out in faith to God. God will heal your physical and spiritual needs, sickness, depression, disease, fear, poverty, pain, weariness. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. 
what he did 2,000 years ago, he's still doing today. Nine years on, living with incurable cancer, my faith has told me to just take one day at a time and to stand on his promises. And can I tell you this? I love Jesus more now than I did back in 1993 when I first came to faith because he's given me a life full of joy and purpose. So at this point, I'd like to pray for you if you are sick. But before I pray for your healing, I'd like to give you this opportunity to receive Jesus as your personal saviour. So there's three reasons why you need Jesus. Jesus loves you. He desires to have a relationship with you and give you a life full of joy and purpose. So the first reason why you need Jesus is you have a past. You can't go back. But he can. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Second reason is you need a friend. Jesus knows the worst about you, but yet he believes the best. And finally, he holds the future. Who else are you going to trust? So if you'd like to begin a personal relationship with Jesus, please pray this prayer with me. Lord, I am sorry for the things I have done wrong in my life. I ask your forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross for me to set me free from my sins. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit and be with me forever. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you pray that prayer with me, there are angels rejoicing in heaven. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm going to pass you over to Alan shortly. And he will follow that up. But for now, I'm going to conclude by praying for the sick. So if you are sick, if you are well, unwell, sorry, if you are struggling with depression, if you're on the brink of suicide, hang on in there. Hang on in there because Jesus loves you and Jesus is real and there is hope in Jesus. And just like that woman who reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and he turned to her and said, your faith has healed you. Tonight, we will reach out together. So join me as I pray for you. Loving Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy. And we thank you for the power of the cross. 
We thank you, Lord God, that your word is active. It's alive and it will accomplish that which it's been sent to do. So, Lord, tonight we reach out in faith, believing that nothing is impossible when we turn to you in faith. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the great healer. And just like you healed that woman with the issue of blood, blood, tonight we reach out in faith and we too touch your garment. I pray the name of Jesus over every sickness, over every disease. Father, I just command cancer to go right now, diabetes to go right now, angina to go right now. Anything that is not of you, Lord, we rebuke it. And I pray the name of Jesus over every sickness. For there is healing in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for your healing power. And I pray, Lord God, that by your stripes we are healed. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So thank you for listening to my story. Alan, I'm going to hand it back over to you. And if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for the experiences you shared in your life and how God has been with you. And for that scripture, which I trust everybody will get hold of tonight, how God says that he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for you. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. He has a plan to do you good and not to do you evil. He says he has a plan. And all he wants you to do is come into that relationship with him and you, he will show you his, that plan for your life. If you pray that prayer with Michael tonight, please let us know. Contact us on our hotline, plus 44794-355-0287. Or go to our lifestoriesworldwide.com website. And there you find a link on how can I get to know God. You'll also be able to get a Bible app. Lots of information you can find if you go to our website. So, George, I'm going to hand over to you now for your questions for Michael. Thanks, George. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Michael. What a story. Well, the first question I want to ask you, of course, is about your dad. You told us about your dad and um, how growing up with your dad and how violent it was. Have you ever had the opportunity to reconcile with him or, you know, tell him about Jesus? Sadly, George, my father died uh, back in, well, two years ago now. But yes, I did uh, tell him about Jesus. He knew that Jesus was everything to me. And surprisingly, my dad used to uh, support me in what I did. He used to come along to church meetings now and again to cheer me on. He would come along to some of the CBM meetings I would hold in Gated. So he was always there in the background. Mm -hmm. and, and somehow I think my dad had a faith himself, although he never practiced it. He never discussed his faith with me. I was quite transparent with him. But um, I do believe my dad had a faith as such. Excellent. And how did you become a Christian? Affect your mother and your brothers as well? How did that affect them? Well... My mum, uh, she had a faith. Uh, George, again, she didn't practice it, but she certainly had a faith. Now, sadly, my mum died uh, at the age of 66, and she died of cancer. But I had the pleasure of lying, of, of praying with my mum. As she lay on her deathbed, we held hands together, and I prayed for Jesus to come into our life. Excellent. And I prayed for that hope of Jesus. I prayed for healing. And you know what? Although she wasn't healed of cancer... The greatest of healing of all is salvation because she accepted Jesus as her saviour. And what about your brothers? You said you had a twin brother and another brother. Have you managed to speak? Yes, to me, me twin brother. I have a twin brother and a younger brother. Um, me, me twin brother was a believer. Um, he's a backslider, uh, sadly. <laughs> and uh, my younger brother, he doesn't really get involved with church. I don't know where he is, to be honest with you. He's a bit of a travelling guy. But uh, my younger brother, sorry, my twin brother, him and I were sort of joined at the hip when we were growing up. Uh, as I said to you earlier, we were into petty crime and uh, my twin brother and I were sort of, we were a two-man team. Um, so if I got locked up, he got locked up with me. If I got a hiding from my dad, he got a hiding from my dad with me. 
So wh what kind of things did you actually do with, with this petty crime? Were you really bad boys? It was many sort of pinching chocolate uh, sweets from uh, Woolworths, actually. Do you remember the old <laughs> shop, Woolworths? We used to go in there. But I yes, I do remember Woolworths, yes. And uh, I'll tell you a true story, George. I went into uh, Woolworths one night from school, and I decided to show off in front of these girls, and I grabbed a handful of pick and mix, <laughs> uh, and I told the girls to wait outside the shop, and I would give them some free sweets. And as I was handing these sweets over to the girls... Uh, a member of the security team came out and grabbed me by the collar and he whisked me back into the shop. Next thing I know, the police were called and I was taken home in a police court, uh, vehicle. And when I got home, my dad bashed the living, living daylights out of me and I didn't do it again. <laughs> I certainly never did that again. Uh, we, we've all had the experience of being the pick and mix uh, counter at um, Walworths. <laughs> now, your life was going great. You had a great job. And you said that we all need Jesus. Why did you need Jesus at that particular time? stories live i guess you know i had a life which was blessed i was i had a very very good job um i was really blessed with my work i loved my job a fantastic wife and two beautiful daughters and uh money was no object i was quite well off but there was always just this emptiness that just there was a void in my life there was something missing and um as i say when i got talking to this guy off the railway who shared his story about how Jesus had turned his life over, around. I thought, well, maybe that's the missing piece of the jigsaw that I need. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's something that I need. And, you know, I'm so grateful to Bob Arpey. I think Bob's watching tonight. I'm so grateful that Bob led me to the faith because if I hadn't met Bob, I may not have known Jesus. And God used Bob Arpey to lead me to faith. So God's got a job for all of us guys. Never be afraid to share your faith. Never be afraid to share the good news of Jesus because God needs us in these last days. Amen. Well, of course, before you, uh, uh, you were, you said you were a petty criminal, but you went from being a petty criminal to a policeman. Tell us how that came about. Well, I, I, I've got to say, George, it was a big shock to the family. Okay. How on earth could this, how on earth could this petty criminal turn out to be a cop in London? And thankfully, I was a petty criminal when I was a juvenile. So none of the none of the crimes were actually recorded. Um, I see. Yeah, so basically I went off to London uh, and I didn't know what I was going to do in London. And I was walking down towards Paddington one day and I saw this big advertisement uh, above Paddington Police Station. Come and join the Metropolitan Police. London needs you. And so that's how the journey began there. It was never my intention to be a cop. It just happened. What was life like as a, a London policeman? I mean, was it difficult? Was it easy? Was it corrupt? What, what, what was it like? Well, as I said before, George, I, I, I've skimmed over quite a bit of my testimony tonight. Mm -hmm. 
but when I was in London, I was really in the world. I was a womanizer. Um, I was a bit like my father, really. I was in the casinos. Um, I would go out drinking most nights, uh, chasing after women. And my friend and I had a competition to see who could sleep with the most late woman and see who could sleep with the most nationalities. Mm-hmm. And I'm not proud of that, but that was my life when I was in the world. But um, when I was a cop, I, as I say, when I was in uniform at Holloway, uh, it was quite challenging. I mean, I've dealt with some awful things. I've dealt with a lot of death. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen death or its worst state. And I've dealt with a lot of crime as well. I've been threatened. I've been assaulted. Um, so it takes a special type of person to be a cop, especially in London. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I mean... I mean, most recently the uh, Metro Metropolitan Police have come for criticism. I mean, um, how did you manage to uh, survive, shall we say, as the Metropolitan Policeman? Well, you, well I guess uh, back then it was quite a corrupt culture. I mean, mm-hmm. we didn't have technology. Now police are uh, police themselves. I mean, we have mobile phones. Uh, so even the police are being watched. But back then we got away with blue murder. Um, so... I remember, you know, I'm not proud to share this, George, but uh, on one occasion I was on on the beat in Holloway and I was just a young beat Bobby at the time. And I was walking the streets and uh, there was a guy uh, urinating against the lamppost. The next thing I knew, uh, the next thing I know, a police car pulls up and two colleagues got out and they bundled this guy into the back of the the car uh, and they gave him a good beating. And I got in the car with these two guys and I was mortified, I was horrified. And we went back to the Nick, uh, and uh, these two cops uh, alleged that this guy had assaulted them, when in actual fact they had assaulted him. And I had to go along with it. You know, I had to go along with it, and I'm ashamed to admit that. But that was the way it was. That was the culture. Um, so it was very, very tough. It was very, very hard. The police for me was a way of life, because, as I said you... before... Sorry. How did that make you feel then at the time? <laughs> Well, I, I didn't feel good, George. I mean, I, I didn't feel ashamed, but I didn't feel good. I mean, as I said earlier, I was steeped in the world. I was part of the world. I loved being in the world. And that is a fact. I loved being in the world. You know, I loved the parties. I loved the wildlife. I loved chasing ladies. That was me at the time. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you had. it sounds like we really had a riot of a time, <laughs> even as a policeman. And, but it's okay. You said then you came back to the North East. What was the catalyst then that... Um, Turn it around for you to come back to the northeast. And when we're talking about, for those listening, we're talking when we say northeast, we're talking about the northeast of England, of course. Well, that's right. And just to make it clear, I, I was born and bred in a town called Gated. Now, Gated is about a mile south of Newcastle upon Tyne, mm-hmm. Geordie Land, which it's commonly known as. Uh, but it was when I left the police. Um, it was always my intention to possibly go back. Um, I took a career break. I was getting a bit fed up with the police. I was getting a bit fed up with the culture. We're living with police, working with police, socialising with police. And it was all I know, knew at the time. Mm-hmm. And so it was a career break I took, George. Mm-hmm. But um, things changed because I met a Geordie and I got married to this Geordie and she didn't want me to go back into the police. Excellent. Tell us a little bit about your wife and how she has supported you over these years. You know, I've... Being blessed with a wonderful wife. My wife is an absolute treasure. Um, I often call her my angel, my guardian angel, which isn't true, obviously. But um... Life Stories. Life Stories Live.